Hi, IBD. I'm Meredith Heyman. This is Industry Insights. Thanks so much for watching. For investors taking a shot at the medical sector, figuring out just the right prescription to succeed in the market may make your head spin. But lucky for us, Barron's senior writer, Nicholas Jasinski, is just what the doctor ordered to help us break it all down. Nick, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Meredith. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, what factors should investors be looking at when they're considering the medical sector? You know, for the sake of this interview, we're going to focus on biotech and pharma. Yeah, Meredith. So, you know, the, there are two things in particular that I would say make the, the healthcare industry attractive to investors. And it's particularly true for what's sort of an uncertain year in 2024. First of all, healthcare, it's one of the classic defensive groups in the stock market. That's along with utilities or consumer staples. And it's defensive because most of the businesses in healthcare, they're not sensitive to what's going on in the broader economy. Even if it's a recession, people still need to take their prescriptions. They need to go to the doctor. They need to brush their teeth, but they might eat out at restaurants less or put off buying a new car. So healthcare companies, they tend to have these resilient business models, and that's attractive to investors, especially in uncertain environments. But, you know, Meredith, it's not all about playing defense with healthcare. There's actually real growth in the industry as well. And that's driven by innovation and it makes it sort of similar to the technology sector in that way. Pharma companies, biotech companies, they're always developing new therapies, new drugs for previously untreatable conditions. Medical device companies are coming up with more complex gadgets and equipment. So that there's real growth in the healthcare sector on top of that defensive characteristics. And that's driven by some real, it's like hardcore science and innovation that's happening in the industry. Now, Nick, there's been a delicate dance that the medical industry has done with Wall Street. It's balancing public health interests with shareholder interests. Can you define that for us? Yeah, no doubt about it, Meredith. Um, healthcare in the US is a business and no other country in the world does it quite this way. It can lead to higher costs for patients and you could call it misplaced incentives for, for healthcare providers. Um, what pharma companies argue is that by being able to charge high prices for drugs while they're under an exclusive patent, they can recoup the costs of the development that goes into creating those drugs, but not only those drugs, because most most drug trials don't end up, they don't work. They don't make it to market. So one big winner from a commercial standpoint can pay for the dozens of other drugs under development that will never make it anywhere. And the companies argue that because of this model, it results in more experimentation and overall more successful treatments being developed. But no doubt about it, it's expensive for Americans. Um, I looked up some stats for you. The U.S. spends about 18% of GDP on healthcare. Um, that's outside of the COVID pandemic, which was was weird for all kinds of reasons. Um, that 18%, that's nearly twice as high as the next closest country, which is Germany. And it's four times higher than a lot of other developed countries, like South Korea, for example. How do FDA approvals affect medical sector performance over the long term? Um, it's key. News about drug trial results or, or FDA decisions, um, those can really those can be make or break for a lot of pharma and biotech companies. And it's especially true for some of the smaller startups in the industries. Um, I'm talking about those clinical stage biotechs with little to no revenue, don't have a drug on the market. They've just raised money from investors for development. And it could be that their entire business might hinge on a single drug being approved. Um, they're, they're the bigger pharma and biotech companies like Pfizer or Merck or AbbVie or Eli Lilly, um, they have much larger, more diversified portfolios. There's a mix of treatments. Some of them are already on the market. Others are in the development pipeline. So they're less tied to the success or failure of a single drug. But the smaller biotechs, they, they make for a much more risky investment proposition. Um, it's somewhat of a binary option. It's, 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 it's unlike the overall defensive nature of the healthcare sector. Um, so Meredith, apologies for using, I'll use a baseball analogy. It's like a batter who only hits home runs and strikeouts and barely any singles and doubles. That's that's what sort of what investing in smaller biotech stocks can be like. Either their drug is a success and they hit a home run and the stock soars, or they might strike out and the stock can sometimes go to zero. So it makes for it's it's a it's a risky area for generalist investors to play in. I don't I certainly don't have a medical degree or the the experience to go through these these multiple pages of clinical trial results and make a prediction on which drugs will be approved or not. So it's not an area where most investors can add an edge, if you will. Um, and as a result of that, many choose to stay away from, from those riskier biotech stocks. Now, you mentioned development. When it, there is news of medical trial results, how does that affect the uh, performance of biotech, medical, pharmaceutical stocks? Um, first and foremost, it depends what the result is. If it's right. a positive result, <laughs> uh, 
if it's a positive result, that can lead to a huge rally in the stock in, in just a day. I mean, you, it's, it's not uncommon to see um, a biotech stock jump 15 or 20 percent in a single day because of a good trial result. But the opposite side of that is true as well. So it's it's not for the faint of heart. Are we going to see any upcoming biotech mergers and what effect could that have on the sector? Uh, you know, it's actually been picking up lately. Um, a lot of this, I think, has to do with the, the biotech sector. The stocks have not done so well over the past two years as the Fed has been raising interest rates. And so valuations are a little cheaper. Um, just the, the announcements we've had in the past few months, there's been two acquisitions by AbbVie, one by Roche, one by Pfizer. Um, Merck did another big deal earlier in, in 2023. So, so for the from the perspective of the big pharma companies, which are buying the smaller biotechs, the, the big companies, they can either develop new drugs internally in their labs, or they can go out and acquire these biotech startups that have a promising development pipeline or might be close to having a drug that's about to be approved, but they don't have the whole scale and infrastructure that's required to bring drugs to, to market to actually commercialize a new drug. So the deals can be a win-win, both for the biotech that has the drug and the technology, and for the big pharma company that has all the infrastructure of actually doing the business of selling that drug. Um, Meredith, for the, for the sector more broadly, loss of M&A activity tends to be a positive. It shows that industry insiders think that valuations are attractive or else they wouldn't be buying other companies. Um, and so often you see the entire biotech sector, all the stocks rise when there's an increase in the number of deals as we've been seeing lately. And it's happened. The biotech um, ETF is up a lot at the end of the 2023. We've talked a lot recently about weight loss drugs. Other treatments, we're seeing now some new development for autoimmune disease. What's that that's impact on the medical sector? Yeah, this is, this is a really promising area of drug development and it's been getting a lot more attention lately. Um, there, are really, there, there are three companies that are um, most in the news about this. Those are Argenx, Immunevent, and Biohaven. And uh, without getting too far into it, the, the, all three of them are at different stages of developing treatments for autoimmune disorders, which are things like type 1 diabetes, MS, um, lupus, some kinds of arthritis. So, so these are big potential markets. Those, those, those are mil- we're talking about millions of people who are affected by these. Um, in 2023, all the excitement in the industry, um, you've probably heard about Ozempic and Wagovi. These are these new weight loss drugs from Eli Lilly and Nova Nordisk. Those two stocks are up a ton over the past year. Um, Immunevent, Biohaven have done just as well. That's on excitement about their autoimmune disease uh, treatments, and it's like we will be hearing a lot more about those soon. And another area we haven't really been discussing are medical devices in the sector. How are they impacting performance? New medical devices, if you will. Um, Yeah, so the the medical device and equipment makers, the the big three there are Abbott Laboratories, Stryker, and Medtronic. Um, And there's kind of, there's two different businesses in there. One One is some pretty basic consumable stuff like syringes or surgical sponges, um, those sort of things. But, but the, the more interesting area are the equipment like pacemakers, um, glucose monitoring devices, artificial knees and hips. And this is similar to biotech. There's constant innovation happening there. There are new devices that these companies are bringing to market. Um, but there are also two big long-term trends that are lifting sales for, for medical device makers. Um, one of those is in, in developed markets like the US or Europe, people are getting older and that means that they need more artificial hips, more pacemakers. Um, at the same time, in emerging markets where populations are much younger, countries are getting richer, uh, medical care is getting more advanced and complex. So there's increasingly more use of, of more complex equipment that uses more of these consumables and, and greater penetration of these kinds of devices. Um, and then you have this, this, this kind of more short-term uh, tailwind, which is COVID was a huge disruption for the industry. It meant a lot of deferred elective procedures, things like a um, knee replacement. If it was, if a hospital was overwhelmed by COVID patients, chances are they weren't doing a lot of knee replacements at the time. Those have been coming back to normal. 2024 should be the first really normal year for the healthcare industry since COVID. Um, so that's, that's more of a short-term positive catalyst for the medical device makers. All right, Nick, we'll be watching. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. This is Industry Insights. I'm Meredith Heyman. Stay tuned to IBD for more. We'll see you next time.